This is the Italian Citizenship Podcast, hosted by Marco Permunian and Rafael Di Furia. Hello there and welcome to another episode of the Italian Citizenship Podcast presented by ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com. Of course, as always, we are back here with Italian attorney Marco Permunian. How are you doing, man? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And Mike, Mike Corradi hey, from everyone. the History of Italy podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining thank us again. Thank you very much for having me again. It's been a pleasure. It's We had so much fun yeah. in the episode that we just recorded uh, talking about the, the, the kingdom of Italy. Exactly. And now we want to move on to talk about the current modern republic of italy but just as a very important note like i mentioned in the last episode this is not required knowledge for anybody who is interested in italian citizenship by descent this is just an episode that marco and i wanted to do because we were interested in to know more about italian history because it's, it's great to be able to know about the process of Italian citizenship, but when you can have the context of Italian history and to know what was going on here in Italy at the time, it can give you a little bit more of an idea why some things came to pass the way that they did. So that's why we invited Mike to come to record these episodes of this podcast. Also, he'll be on an episode of my uh, my project, Not Your Average Globetrotter, or on YouTube, Rafael Di Furia, my name. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, so let's just, just jump straight into this because in the last episode, we ended off with Mussolini's uh, fascist era of politics and history in Italy, uh, the 20 plus year period. But now we wanted to move on to what would be kind of the later part of that right around the end, uh, jumping to 1946, June 2nd, uh, when Italy became a republic and uh, as well as 1948, kind of combining the two. So Marco, from uh, the perspective of Italian citizenship, what is the importance of those dates? 1948 is a very important date because that's when the Italian Constitution came into effect. Uh, the Italian Constitution included uh, very many provisions, but one uh, in particular was very important uh, for people who are interested in Italian citizenship because the Italian Constitution gave men and women equal rights, including the right to transfer their Italian citizenship onto their children. So um, as we all know, in Italy, citizenship is passed from parent to child. That's the Jure Sanguinis principle. Um, but before 1948, only men was con were considered by the Italian law as able to transfer their citizenship to their children. So only the head of the family was able to pass citizenship, pass on citizenship. So if you only had a female ancestor before 1948, uh, that female ancestor could not really pass her citizenship to her children. But starting from 1948, men and women became equal in the eyes of the law. So if you have a female ancestor uh, whose child was born prior to, I'm sorry, after 1948, uh, then you can apply for citizenship by descent through an Italian consulate or uh, through an Italian municipality. But on the other hand, if the child of the woman in question was born prior to 1948, you can technically apply for citizenship through an Italian consulate because you technically speaking don't qualify for Italian citizenship. However, uh, you can pursue Italian citizenship via the court system because Luckily, in 2009, there was a very important uh, Supreme Court decision that said that this situation that I just described was highly discriminatory against women and uh, it should cease to exist. So basically, because of the 2009 Supreme Court's decision, it is now possible to petition the court and easily get Italian citizenship, even if you are using a female ancestor whose child was born before 1948. Absolutely fascinating as always, Marco, and uh, such great detail that you've gone into. So thank you so much for that. Um, and Mike, so I'm just curious also, because that's a huge step for uh, so many people who are wanting to apply for Italian citizenship. Do they have a female ancestor who gave birth before? Or if they're going through a female line at all, like, do they have to go through court? Or can they just do it through Jure Sanguinis? 
I'm assuming that there may have been a feminist push in the country at that time. Uh, what was going on in Italy during this period? Well, um, that was the end of the Second World War and the end of the fascist era. So, you know, the, if we want to refer specifically to the role of women under fascism, it was, you know, you tend to see it as a sort of block because, you know, the fascist era, women's rights took a big step back. You know, for the fascist regime, the woman was the angel of the household who was supposed to stay at home, uh, produce an incredible number of children for the patria, you know, for the homeland. Um, no attempt at all of giving voting rights was made during the fascist era. Indeed, the first universal female suffrage was 1945 in, in administrative uh, in elections. So 1946 shows us a very much divided Italy because you, at the end of the war, you had a North which was under Nazi occupation with a puppet regime, uh, Mussolini, the, the Republic of Salah, set up by the Nazis. And in the South, you had an alternative government, which is the CLN, the Comitato di Liberazione Nazionale, the National Liberation Committee, working with the Allies. You almost had a civil war, which... In 1946, it was still ongoing because uh, a lot of the ex-fascists were being hunted down and killed by the ex-partisans. A lot of atrocities also on the part of the partisans, we need to say it, but obviously it was a reaction, you know, to 20 years of, of, of a repressive regime. So 1946 was the moment in which Italy, as uh, Marco was saying, was called to decide, do we want to continue to be a monarchy or do we want to become a republic? And there was a great push, particularly in the North, the, the Occupy North, to become a republic. Their women's rights were a bit more advanced. There was still a, a, a sort of, you know, agricultural, patriarchal society, but we had a lot of women involved in the resistance movement. Particularly, the, the women in the resistance were used as staffette, so messengers. They were sent around. There was obviously less suspicious to see a girl going around than, than a young man. And so they did have a very active role in the resistance. And, and the resistance was very much continued in the, the post-war period. You know, the, 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 the constitution, the Italian constitution is an anti-fascist constitution. It comes as a reaction to the fascist era and the, uh, era and the newfound liberties there. So Italy was called to decide monarchy or republic. And, you know, the monarchy was that of Vittorio Emanuele III, Victor Emmanuel III, who was very much seen as compromised with the fascist regime. Obviously, at the beginning, he could have done more to stop it. Some people argue that, in reality, he couldn't have really done that much, that it was almost inevitable by that point. But the Italian monarchy was seen very much as compromised in its, let's say, cohabitation, I wouldn't say collaboration, although obviously the, the many laws were signed by the king in the end, uh, with, with the fascist regime. The monarchy at the last moment did try to make a play which was very much hated by the pro-Republican side. So Victor Emmanuel III abdicated in favour of his son in May of 1946, and he became Umberto II. Uh, the first was actually assassinated, Umberto I, in 1900. We do have a king that was assassinated in 1900, which was Umber uh, Umberto I. Umberto II, 1946, is, is known as Il Re di Maggio, the King of May, because basically his reign lasted just one uh, month. But it was a really smart move on the part of King Victor uh -huh. Emmanuel, because he was sort of showing the people that this old regime compromised in the, in the collaboration, let's say, with the, with the fascist regime, was taking a step back. He was leaving the throne to his son, a young, handsome-looking, with a beautiful wife, Maria José. Um, so they were, you know, like a modern tabloid, uh, Meghan and, and Harry kind of uh -huh. cup. Not really, but I mean, so that the, was more... The, 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 the equivalent of the day. Let's say the monarchy was moving more into a modern mm -hmm. uh, monarchy that we would talk about and read about and not so much, you know, a, a, a power, uh, because, you know, the king had had power of veto, had power to declare war, etc. So, you know, it, it was basically a figurehead. And, and it worked to, in part because it did sway some of the vote. I mean, the vote for 
the republic was overwhelmingly in favor of the republic, but many, many millions of people also voted to maintain the monarchy. So there were some regions that it was a majority that had yeah, voted in, for in the it. south, for example, yeah, yeah. or there was a couple of places also in the north. Oh, actually, yeah, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's small areas that there's you can find it quite easily on internet. It has sort of a mm. a layout region by region and even by comune by comune, so really? municipality by municipality. And there are a couple of places in the north, maybe. In Piedmont area, that mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can see that the, the yeah. kings coming from that area, and so in the end, the, the republic won out. The king and his family went in, into exile. They were only recently allowed back into the country in the early two thousands, mm -hmm. uh, and there are still some people in Italy who, uh, yeah. who are uh, how can we say, campaigning to get back. There, it's, the I'm monarchy. shocked by the the campaign, the movement. Even it's come up in the news quite recently. The 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 princess has become this this powerhouse of her own. Like her father's very much pushing her. I think she was born and raised in France, or at least she was educated in France. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. like really. Trying to be well, you know, something. our our royal families from Savoy originally, mm -hmm. which originally was was part of France. I mean, it's, it's still part of France. Right? Right. Um, so you know, the, the the nation decided that they wanted to be a republic, as Marco said. Then, between the second of June, nineteen forty six, which recently, recently, relatively recently, became a national holiday. So we have to thank, I believe, President Ciampi for making that a, a national holiday, 2nd of June, which is conveniently the day after my anniversary. So we always get a, an evening off for Fair our anniversary. <laughs> uh, so thank you, President Ciampi, for, for instituting the 2nd of June as a national holiday. We get a day off there. And so, like Marco said, you know, on the 2nd of June, that was the vote. They didn't know the results until a couple of days later. Again, there it was very, you know, uh, the, the votes were coming in for the monarchy and at a certain point they start to move towards the republic. Some days later, there was also actually violence in those days because of the uncertainty. So pro-monarchy, pro-republic violence in the streets. You know, it, it was very much a battlefield. I mean, the Ministry of the Interior in Rome had the uh, Cavalli di Frisi, I don't remember what they're called in English, but those X's of metal that you see like on the beaches of Normandy. So you can imagine Rome, it's around, not Rome, but the Ministry of the Interior surrounded by barbed wire. Wow. And, you know, it's like almost like a war zone because it was, it was a, I don't think we understand also in Italy how much, uh, how close we were to a civil war in that period. Uh, but also in later times. Yeah, maybe even we'll, 70s, 80s, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll talk about that when we, yeah. when we get to the next date. Yeah, the, 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 the anni di piombo, the years mm -hmm. of lead. But we'll, we'll mention that when we move on to the next point. So we, we became a republic. And as Marco said, between the 2nd of June, 1946, you know, we had this new situation in which, you know, people looked at each other and said, okay, well, now we need a constitution. <laughs> so they created La Costituente, which is the parliamentary group, which worked on this wonderful document, which is the Italian constitution. And uh, between that date and the 1st of January, 1948, when the constitution entered into effect, um, we had the, the writing and then the, uh, the promulgation of the Constitution of the Republic of Italy. Fascinating. And so uh, this is the one thing that I also, I, I always am very interested by because uh, how recent, relatively speaking, the, the Italian Constitution has come. It was written very recently. And you even see some more modern ideas that are not too far off from things that we very much talk about today. I, I've read through the Constitution a number of times here, the Italian Constitution, and there's always one part that sticks out to me, the right for a couple to be able to remain together, this romantic idea to be able to be in the same place. And that's also partially based on um, the ability for one person to be able to remain in the country, something that Marco and I have talked about so so much, uh, Iure Matrimoni, like citizenship through marriage. Uh, and this ability for... Uh, a couple to remain together um, and as well as many other ideas anyway I'm, I'm running off into another direction but just quickly to move on to the next date uh, we have a lot really as far as the major dates regarding Italian citizenship really kind of skips from 1948 until 1992 but in between there is a significant date for some people that will make a difference for their ability to get citizenship in Marco uh, what is that date and what happened uh, or what's what was the decision Decision made that is so important for Italian citizenship. Yeah, exactly. So until 1983, 
women under Italian law became Italian citizens automatically. So that's very important to know for people who uh, want to apply for citizenship through marriage and specifically for women who want to apply for citizenship through marriage because if you are a woman and if you got married before 1983, then you became an Italian citizen under Italian law automatically. So you don't have to go through the process that you would have to go through if you got married after that date. So if you got married before that date, you became an Italian citizen automatically through the marriage. So now you just have to go through a process through the Italian consulate, which is a simplified process in comparison to those people who got married afterwards. You just have to go through this process to have the Italian consulate acknowledge that you became an Italian citizen through the marriage in the date in which you uh, got married to your husband. So it's kind of a simplified process because, first of all, uh, that it takes less time for you to become an Italian citizen. You don't have to speak Italian. There is no such requirement for you because you are already an Italian citizen uh, through the marriage. On the contrary, for people, men and women, who got married to an Italian citizen after 1983, they do have to speak Italian. They do have to apply for naturalization. So they have to file a petition for Italian citizenship. And they don't become Italian citizen from the moment of the marriage. Rather, they become Italian citizens from the moment in which citizenship is formally granted to them. It's a longer process. They have to pass an Italian language test and maybe I can refer people to our episodes where we talk about citizenship through marriage in detail but that's the main difference between people who got married after 1983 and women who got married to Italian men uh, before 1983. And so so during this period when we're talking about this kind of gap like other than the 1983 which is so very important um, Mike, what was going on in Italy around this time that was so important? Because as we were just talking about a second ago, there was some fighting. There was some things going on in Italy. There was, it was a very important time in history. And it's even uh, I've heard uh, some of the older generation in Italy talking about how maybe not so old, but the generation of people maybe a little bit older than we are uh, talking about how back then people really took politics seriously and they took their views seriously. We were out in the streets fighting. We were doing this. We were doing that. You guys just sit on your phones now. You you weak little uh, millennials, <laughs> all these different arguments. Um, but what was it that was going on during this period of time? Well, first of all, important from a personal point of view to refer back to what Marco was saying is my mum got Italian citizenship thanks to the pre-1983 <laughs> situation because she married my father in uh, 1975, so she became an Italian citizen out of uh, use, uh, right of, right of uh, well, matrimony. So, uh, And it, actually, my mum will allow me also to connect me to, to one of the things that was going on during that period, and that is my mum came to the, uh, came to it Italy, uh, as an au pair girl, which is something that, that's not so common nowadays. Basically, you go and live in a family, you look after the children, you clean up, and etc., etc. And she came to Milan to uh, a well to do bourgeois middle class family of bankers, a banking family, by the name of Sindona. Now, I don't know if that means much to anyone, but it's one of the most important mafia bankers in, in history. Oh, wow. Michele Sindona, he actually ended up being poisoned in, in prison, so he wouldn't reveal what he knew some years later. Well, I'm glad uh, to hear that we're safe for your mother to yeah, be my able to talk okay. about Well, well my mum never really got any, I mean, she, one, the only thing she remembers relatively related is one day everybody disappeared, she was left with a dog, and the carabinieri, the police, showed up asking where the family was, but that's, uh, that's all she was uh, <laughs> involved. But whoa. That's the first thing that was really uh, between, as you were asking, Rafael, between 46 and 83. That was the year in which the mafia really came to the foreground. It really started getting organized, mm -hmm. starting from the Sicilian family, the Corleone family, mm -hmm. uh, Rina, uh, Ligio, various mafiosi from that area. 
And uh, 1983 is particularly significant because that was the year in which the war of the mafia on the state really sort of upped the stakes. Indeed, 1982, the year before, had seen the killing of uh, Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, who was a general, um, a police general, let's say, to, to simplify, because... Here in Italy, we have a very complicated police organization, but to, to simplify for our uh, American, English viewers, etc., he was a, a general of the, poli of the military police who had managed actually to defeat in the late 70s the terrorist phenomena in Italy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Unfortunately, then he was sent to Sic Sicily, isolated, without help, and he was killed by the mafia. At the same time, his sacrifice did bring into effect some laws which then allowed two young judges who at the time were, were starting their anti-mafia work, that is Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino, to set up the um, investigations and the documentations for one of the, the greatest anti-mafia trials in history, which is called the Maxi Processo, 1986, then it would come just three years later, in which they actually had to build a special underground bunker, bunker to hold, to host these mm. trials. They, they, they set, you know, the, the many, many, many sentences, I think several thousands of years of, of sentencing were given, uh, cumulatively speaking, and it was a huge, huge success in the war against the mafia, for which uh, Carlo Alberto gave his life in, in 82. He had been fighting since then. We mentioned also that he had, in a certain sense, defeated terrorism, because as you said, Rafael, the late 70s in particular in Italy or even you could go back to 68, you know, the whole student movement that then developed into the 70s were called the Anni di Piombo, the years of lead, in which there were a lot of terrorist uh, acts, both left-wing terrorism with the Brigate Rosse and also right-wing terrorism. So, for example, 79, the, the kidnapping and killing of the president of the Christian Democrats, Aldo Moro, by the, um, the Red Brigades. 1980, for example, the bombing of the station of Bologna, the bombing of Piazza della Loggia. So a lot of activity, a lot of killings, a lot of a very difficult situation in which, like you were saying, Rafael, politics was very, very strongly felt in one side or the other. There was a lot of activism, uh, a lot of activism going on that now, yes, yeah, we couldn't even yeah. think of people being active on, on that level, let's no. say. Although it, we have had some divisive yeah. moments. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about 92 in a bit. That was also another very divisive moment in history. Um, so 1983 is a time when we, we have done... Uh, some great work against terrorism, still struggling to defeat the mafia, still haven't, unfortunately, and in my opinion, there's not enough talk of anti-mafia activity at the moment. We should be doing a lot more uh, against the mafia. Basically, from 1946 to 1983, Italy went through a, a revolution, but not in the sense of a violent revolution, but an economic revolution. It's actually known as Il Miracolo Italiano, the Italian miracle, which is basically the name given to the economic boom of the 50s and 60s, where Italy went from being a patriarchal rural society to a country which is now one of the G8, you know, one of the most industrialized countries in the world, in particular in the north here in Veneto, in Lombardy, in Emilia Romagna. Yeah. In Liguria, the, the huge industries in, in Piedmont, uh, Fiat, etc. Yeah. It, it went through a huge economic boom, helped very much by the United States. Because, you know, we mustn't forget that, that Italy in the Cold War was like a frontier state. You know, we had a, a border with Yugoslavia, which was a, a communist country. So the United States and the NATO bloc were very much interested in keeping Italy on, on their side. There was a lot of investment, a lot of also organization. For example, they had this organization called Gladio, which was a sort of covert secret organization to try and keep the left out of power. And indeed, from 1946 to 1984, the left were kept out of power. And some say that, for example, the killing of Aldo Moro in 79 was related to what was called the Compromesso Storico, because the late 70s and early 80s saw the left actually move in and uh, take power in part through the Socialist Party of, of Bettino Craxi, for example. It was also a period of, of a, a, 
a cultural renaissance for Italy because we had the period of, you know, the neorealismo italiano, the, the, the apex of Italian cinema, Federico Fellini, Mario Monicelli, Dino Risi, some of amazing, some amazing films were, were, were created and produced in, in that period. You know, some, some cultural uh, icons were set, you know, who doesn't know the term paparazzi, for example? That's a right. word which came from a film by Federico Fellini. Wow. Uh, the, the Dolce Vita, Federico Fellini, he was followed around by a photographer named Paparazzo. And he'll say, come on, Paparazzo. Ah. And that's where the word paparazzi comes from. It's a word of, of Federico Fellini. And so that was the Italy of 1983, an Italy that was economically doing very, very well, but started to be seeped in the most deeply rooted corruption that you could imagine on many, many uh, different levels. And uh, in this process of, of cultural and, and economic uh, renaissance and boom, television played a fundamental uh, role. You know, we, 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 I think we mentioned in the previous episode that the Italian language um, was taught to the Italians thanks to television. Also, Italians sometimes learned to read and write thanks to television because they had a program in the early days of television called Non è mai troppo tardi, it's never too late, which taught people how to read and write. So the more television came into people's houses, the more the Italian language uh, became a common way for people to communicate. Although, you know, among intellectuals already in the 12th, uh, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, people were communicating at the time of, of Frederick II of Dante, people could communicate in Italian. Um, so television was absolutely fundamental, but in 1983, you could have, you had this immense choice, you know, you could watch Channel 1, you could watch Channel 2, or you could watch Channel 3, and that was it, basically. <laughs> you could do nothing else. There was actually a law against uh, a, a fourth, let's say, you, know, you couldn't set up a private channel on a national level in Italy. So they had this guy, this entrepreneur, this real estate entrepreneur from Milan, um, who, who had done very well early on in Milan setting up a real estate business. Some people um, have done some investigations into sort of the origin of that money, which may not be completely, uh, let's say, legal. Mm -hmm. there, there's some, some uh, proof of that. And so what he did, he had this idea, which is actually genius. So, you know, he said, okay, I'm not allowed to have a national channel. So what do I do? I buy tons and tons and tons of local stations and I just get everybody to show the same thing at the same time every day. And so you had these couriers going around all of Italy with these cassettes and at eight o'clock in the evening, your local channel in Rovigo would show the same thing that the local channel in Reggio Emilia would show. And... At a certain point, the government looked at that and said, no, no, this is, this is not, you know, this is, take, I don't want to use something vulgar. This is making fun of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> the Italians I think I know where you were going with that one. <laughs> prendere per il culo, I say <laughs> Anyway, uh, and so they prohibited, and there was this huge uproar, you know, by the people because this guy had brought in soap operas, you know, dynasty, he'd brought in television shows, he'd brought in half-naked women, and people loved it. So, uh, Something then... Something that can still be found on a tele Italian television till this Not, day. it hasn't been so bad in recent years, I must say. No, now it's just uh, a late night thing. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, after that, uh, when the socialist came in under Bettino Craxi, he sorted things out, and he made all the situation legitimate, and this entrepreneur, uh, as you can imagine, was Silvio Berlusconi, okay? And he was the one he had, uh, he started to build his uh, television empire, which basically brings us back around to 1992. Fascinating as always. <laughs> so, Marco, what was it that actually happened in 1992 that was so important for Italian citizenship? In 1992, a new law regarding Italian citizenship came into effect, a law which replaced the older uh, law which came into effect in 1912 and we spoke spoke about that law before but the 1992 law changed a few very important things regarding Italian citizenship uh, first of all uh, it was explicitly mentioned in the law that both men and women could pass their Italian citizenship onto their children so it was the first time in which the law actually included that provision explicitly uh, allowing women to transfer their citizenship. Uh, second of all, that law allowed people who 
voluntarily acquired the citizenship of a foreign country by naturalization to maintain their Italian citizenship. So prior to that law, it was not possible for somebody who chose to become a citizen of a foreign country to also maintain their Italian citizenship. But starting from 1992, that became possible. So the person who chose to become naturalized in the US or uh, the UK or wherever they were emigrating, emigrating, they no longer lost their Italian citizenship. And uh, finally, the process for citizenship through marriage was uh, regulated in detail. So all of the provisions that are established when a, a person can acquire citizenship through marriage and how were included for the first time in a uh, law which regulated the process in uh, detail, which is the process that basically uh, people use today. So they can apply for citizenship through marriage after three years from the marriage, uh, if they're living uh, abroad or two years, if they're living in Italy and that time is cut into half if they have minor children. So I believe these were the most important provisions included in the 1992 citizenship law. I would definitely agree. Like the ability for somebody to remain Italian and to hold on to that identity in a formal uh, way is huge. I mean, I, 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 I've been in contact with plenty of people. My father came to America and he naturalized, but in 93. So this person was then able to come and actually then move to Italy to make a life in this country. And that's, again, I, I've, I always repeat myself on this point, but I always think it's a, such a beautiful thing how Italy allows people to hold on to the citizenship, the natural, the, the, the nationality, to be able to have the choice to, to come and remain in Italy. The benefit, of course, also is that there are those people who do want to, to go to other parts of the European Union and make a life there. Okay, I could go on a rant for hours about how I think it's better, of course, if you're a citizen, you at least know what it's like to live in Italy first, and why I might argue for reasons for there to be at least a minimum um, uh, time to reside in Italy, but I am going off in a completely different direction here. But in Italy during this time, Mike, what was going on? Like, what was, what was this shift that may have pushed for this to be allowed for citizenship? Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I just wanted to say I totally agree with you. I mean, you should be allowed to collect citizenship, like, you know, have like a card. I got that one. Like a Pokemon card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Dutch got it. Yeah, it'd be a beautiful, beautiful world if everybody was a citizen area. But anyway, I'm working utopia. On it. <laughs> utopia. Now, uh, also, I forgot to mention 1983 was the last date. 1982, Italy wins the World Cup for the third time. Ah, important. Very important. Yeah, this very year. important. Extremely uh, important. Yeah, yeah. The, then 2006, that was the fourth time. So that's four World Cups. Two Two Europeans, so. Uh, but, uh, just <laughs> well, I'm glad you it. covered that, especially this year. It's very, very it's important. It's a touchy point. subject. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine for you also. It's a very difficult subject to talk about. I, this well, year I just, I mean, for the final, for the England v Italy final, I just didn't know what to do to the point that it was almost a disappointment. So I was a lot more excited for the two semi-finals, uh -huh. which were for me the finals, than. Uh, then the final, which was like, oh, yeah, whoever wins, it's fine. Yeah, so. uh, you win either way. <laughs> win, yeah, I was ready. <laughs> got the British passport, got the Italian passport. Yeah, I got them I'm both good. ready. Just psh, hide the one that <laughs> hide the one that loses. So. And so we said before that from forty six to eighty three, it seemed like a different country. Almost the same could be said from eighty three to ninety two, and that lot lots uh, a lot less time, because basically between nineteen eighty three and nineteen ninety two, what was known as the First Republic, La Prima Repubblica, was disintegrated in a very very short span, because from the the end of the first, Second World War until the early eighties, and then continuing also in the eighties, the political scene in Italy was dominated by one party, which was the Democrazia Cristiana, the Christian Democrats closely tied to the Vatican, and in the 80s and at the start of the 90s, the strong socialist party under Bettino Craxi. At the start of the 90s, a small investigation into one set of kickbacks by one politician that, that one politician was receiving exploded into a huge investigation called Mani Pulite, 
clean hands, which basically started on the level of, of, you know, local politicians, local entrepreneurs, reaching national levels to the point that the DC, the Christian Democrats, and the Socialist Party disintegrated in the in the term of in the span of very very few years, reaching all the way up to Bettino Craxi, the leader of the Socialist Party, who fleed, who had to flee to to Amamet, to Africa, uh, where he died in exile, basically to avoid being put on trial, as many many people were, many high level politicians, many entrepreneurs, a lot of suicides also in that period, and indeed it's a very divisive era. The early 90s are a very divisive era. On the one hand, you have Italians who really saw in this period a chance at a new risorgimento, a new renaissance, you know, a way to clean up all the endemic, deep-rooted corruption, take it all away, and to start anew, start afresh with the so-called Second Republic, a whole series of new parties. The old Communist Party started to various changes of names. It went from the Partito Comunista to the the Communist Party, to the Partito Democratico di Sinistra, the left Democratic Party, then to the PD now, and so on. On the other hand, you have people who saw this period as a political attack by a part of the magistrates on a certain political entity on the centre-right, for example. Um, So you have these two conflicting views, which, which lasted almost, you know, perhaps it's not so much on the scene today. It lasted as long as the Berlusconi era lasted, let's say. And so in this era, 1992, um, also we must mention that this was also another moment, another peak of the mafia um, mafia war on... (laughs) I say war on the state, but there's still now a lot of uncertainty on how much the Italian state was involved with the mafia. Also, very, very high levels. For example, there's a lot of suspicion about one of the dominant figures of the Christian Democrats, Giulio Andreotti, and how much he may have been involved and and connected to to the Sicilian mafia. Hmm. In 1992, we have another moment of of, of great, tragic moment of of the war of the mafia with the killings of uh, Giovanni Falcone, and Paolo Borsellino, we mentioned uh, when we were talking about the early 80s, they had started their investigation, which had led to the Maxi Processo, and they were were killed in in, in 1992. Again, the the usual plot, you know, abandoned by the state, isolated by their colleagues, and then killed by the mafia. So very, very sad moment, very divisive moment for some people, a moment of great hope, Uh, For others, a moment of great danger because they saw a whole political system uh, that was put in danger by what they see or saw as a politicized magistrature. And at the end of this period of great transformation, so 1992 is right in the middle of that period, 1994 we have the start of the Berlusconi era because seeing this movement, seeing what had happened, this destruction of the First Republic, Berlusconi, Silvio Berlusconi, felt the responsibility um, to, to, he called it entrata in campo, to to, uh, enter the field and to uh, stop sort of the left-wing drift of the country. Uh, And obviously, for a certain part of the electorate, that was, he was the man that was needed at the time. From the point of view of citizenship, what we could say uh, is that sort of the 80s and 90s saw the reversal, in a certain sense, of immigration to sort of uh, emigration to immigration in Italy. So the 80s and 90s were immigration from Albania, from Northern Africa, from Slavic, from, from from the Balkans started into Italy. And so that may also have been one of the elements which once again, push the country to sit down, have a look and consider, you know, who could be a citizen, who could not be a citizen. Um, There's also a debate now, you know, we're in 2021 about the usolis, for example, which is the right of citizenship by birth. If you were born in Italy, uh, do you have a right to be a citizen? But to remain, to, to stay with 1992, it was another important dividing moment in Italian history, uh, which then went into the Berlusconi era. Interesting. And so this 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 era, did it really give into what we see today? Is it I mean it kind of from what you're saying, it really does sound like it laid the foundation politically. But do we see that now they're trying to undo some of what's being done, or is it trying to continue in that direction? 
Well, since then we've had another great change or, 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 or well, what could have been a great change because we had now the presence in Italy of a movement because they call themselves a movement, which is the Five Star Movement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, here, apologies, but we're going on sort of the area of personal opinion. But from what I could see is it potentially had really, again, repetition, potential to change yeah. things. So once, I mean, once again to face and deal with the endemic corruption, deep-rooted corruption that we have in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the Five Star Movement sort of got eaten up by the system. Uh, in the sense they became a little bit more mainstream. They're now a member of parliament. The um, 2018 election saw them as the first party and we had a sort of a uh, soap opera for a couple of months to see who they were going to ally with, whether they were going to ally with the left or with the Lega, which they did in the end, the, the sort of uh, centre-right um, uh, Lega, it's called, the League Party. And from, uh, I would say, was it June 2018, correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, June 2018 to, uh, I would believe, I would say 2019. I think the government lasted uh, around a year. Then the, 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 the league leader, Matteo Salvini, withdrew his support from the government. And so then, again, we had the ball going back to the court of the president of the republic, who steps in. Uh, when a government needs to be formed and he uh, created a second government in which the five star movement so this sort of anti-establishment protest movement then allied with the left mm -hmm. uh, and that lasted another little while and that, that same government uh, transformed into what we have now which is the Draghi Mario Draghi ex um, leader of the European Central Bank has formed a government which a huge support. I mean, it's not the widest support that a government has ever had mm -hmm. in Republican history, but it's the second widest support because in times of crisis, <laughs> we in Italy, we argue, 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 and then we have to turn to somebody right. to come and save us. <laughs> uh, we did it in 2020 with um, with Mario Draghi. We did it in 2011 with uh, Mario, another Mario, Mario Monti at the end of the Berlusconi era when our uh, economy was heading in the direction of a default, you know, Greece style situation so you know did the did the did the 90 early 90s set the foundations yes probably yes because we're still searching for a solution to that system to that period i mean the the, the echo of the early 90s we can still hear it today in in the 2020s Fascinating. And so I guess this takes us up to the most recent um, of the interest of Italian citizenship, at least. What happened most recently regarding Italian citizenship? Salvini in 2018, uh, the Ministry of Interior of that time uh, changed, decided to change uh, the citizenship law and introduced a new requirement uh, for people to become Italian citizens through marriage and by residency. He try to make the process a little bit more difficult for people who were interested in, again, citizenship through naturalization, so by marriage or by residency. And this, I want to be clear on this, does not affect citizenship by descent. So it's not a requirement for citizenship by descent. But for people who want to get citizenship through marriage and through residency, they now have to speak Italian. So uh, there's a test, a language test that is required. Uh, we did record an episode recently about the um, like the level that is required, where you can take the test, the schools that allow you to take the test. So um, maybe people can watch that episode to gather more information. But uh, the level required to apply for citizenship through marriage and through residency is lower intermediate. So if you're interested in applying for citizenship by residency or by marriage, you now have to be able to uh, speak Italian. Yeah, it's um, it was a, a big shakeup here. I remember a lot of people even at that time were, were because it wasn't totally clear what was going on from the language of the wording of uh, what was introduced and even kind of the following weeks is like, wait, is this only for citizenship by naturalization, citizenship through marriage, citizenship by descent? What, what was going on? And so even there were a lot of people even now that are wondering, wait, what's going on? I, they, I read this thing online. I saw this. Do I have to learn Italian as, as somebody who's of, of Italian descent? And it's, it's still causing a lot of confusion yeah. today. 
There was an interesting scandal as well because we had uh, an attempt at uh, a footballer, Suarez, coming into to Italy and apparently he cheated on his Italian test. <laughs> and so there's actually an ongoing investigation, not only into him, but also the school who organized the test because really? his, his, um, his Italian was, was not up to, the, the level is, is B1, but right. the Council of Europe, the Common European Framework B1, and his, his uh, Italian was not up to that level. So there was a bit of a scandal there about that. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not surprised just because, like, it's, when it comes to these sorts of things, that happens. That happens in Italy. And it's not just Italy. Like, it happens in so many countries. It, but it happens more in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to agree and I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth on this one. But uh, So, I guess maybe just to quickly kind of round up, like, what has been, I mean, we just did talk about it a little bit, but... What is the what is going on right now that people should really be aware of that could be pivotal in regards to the future of Italian history that we might look back on in, say, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Like if we were to sit at the same table in 30 years from now, what might be some of those points that we would look at that are going on as we speak? I think you know, it's, it's always hard to say, you know, when when you're living the moment, right. what would we like theoretically. look back at? At the same time, I think we're still, I mean, from a political point of view, Italy is still struggling on both sides of the political spectrum mm -hmm. to, f to, to find a credible institutional representative. And indeed, as I was saying before, time after time, the more we get ourselves mixed up in our own problems and issues and the less the, 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 the political establishment is able to get itself out, the more often we have to revert to what we call a technical government. Mario Draghi is the one who has just been called in to save us from the issues we were having with the previous government. It happened again in, uh, in 2011, at the end of the Berlusconi era, era uh, Mario Monti was called in. So it would be nice to to finally see a moment in Italian history when you can look at that moment and say, okay, that's when our politics became a bit less of a circus and a bit more politics. Mm. Having said this, if you look at the world of 2021, it seems like everybody's following our circus rather than, <laughs> you know, the models ah, yeah. that we used to use, that we used to look for, look to as, yeah. a, you know, look at them, they're serious. Why can't we be like that in Italy? We're looking at them and said, okay, you know, we did that already. You know, we've, we've done that whole thing that you're doing now. So, you know, I, um, I will so, say as an American, it sometimes is embarrassing to look and see what is going on and to see how much of a circus it's become and then there's been a number of times where i've looked at like footage from from the meetings and what's gone on there i'm like wait hold on they're speaking the wrong language <laughs> i shouldn't say exactly. that but like it, exactly. it just a little too familiar yeah 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 but you know that's it i i'm waiting for that i think in the short term we, we could see after the Draghi era, we could see in the next elections another shift to the center right, mm -hmm. uh, possibly under the. F it would be. I mean, although. Well, even before Draghi came in, there was already that push anyway, kind of. In well, you know, some people some people say that Italy is fundamentally a right wing country, mm -hmm. and if you look at our governments throughout history, there have been so many more right wing governments than there have been uh, left wing governments. No, you're not wrong. Uh, at the same time, uh, the next shift could at least bring the first female Presidente del Consiglio, we, we translate it as Prime Minister, it's a little bit different, which is Giorgia Meloni. Uh, that could be something at least, you know, at least for, for women's rights. Italy is doing decently in some areas for recent women's rights, terribly in others. That could be an interesting development to see, you know, that was the moment in history in which Italy had the first woman as, as a prime minister and then maybe even president of the republic. Some people speak about um, Emma Bonino as a possible president of, of the republic from the radical or ex-radical party. Um, that would be the things I would be looking for now. I think now we just have to survive this period, get, <laughs> get, get ho hope that Super Mario gets us uh, through this period. Things are looking decent on, from the point of the economy because in the post-COVID era, there's been a pretty good increase, uh, I think plus 0.8 something percent in mm. uh, uh, foreign uh, exports in the, in the mechanics area. So again, you know, the northern uh, companies. So, you know, cautiously hopeful for the future, who knows? So.
I'll keep my fingers crossed. I would also, by the way, just to clarify for anybody who's watching, he wasn't making a racist remark or anything. That is what people do call Mario Draghi here sometimes. Like, ah, yeah, yeah, Super yeah, yeah, Mario yeah, yeah. is like, it's not like, a, oh, like he's just making fun. No. Yeah, no, no. It's not just stereo. <laughs> also because I would be against myself. So, But it's not to, no, no, it's Super Mario, not in the yeah. sense of, you know, the yeah, character, the but he is. No, but there are people who I've met, they're like, Super what? How could you say such a thing about your no, own country? Yeah. Someone from your, like no. No, but people <laughs> in the banking sector adore Mario Draghi, yeah. and already when he was the the, the president of the uh, European Central Bank, they they gave him the name Super Mario, but because of his his ability, his skills, his knowledge, not because he has any similarity <laughs> with the, with the video game character. So. Well, anyway, I think this is actually going to be a great place to wrap up this episode. So, Mike, thank you so much for it's joining us It's been a again. very great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, guys. It really is wonderful. I'm so glad that we met and we we're able to cross paths and make this happen somehow in the future. I think we need to do something again together because this has been a, a, an absolute blast. Anyway. The only thing missing here is a nice bottle of Rambrusco Chianti, and then I think we'd be here. Yeah. <laughs> I knew there was he's, something he's right. He's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, Mike, if people are wanting to find you online, how can they find you in your podcast? Well, you can find me on wherever you listen to your podcast. Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, etc. A History of Italy. Uh, we're on roundabout episode 120 odd with lots of little extras. There's also a section on fascism that we're doing, Fascism 100, because 2021 is the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the, the fascist um, party. And we really believe that there are some lessons that we are not taking from that period that should be learned. And uh, on our website, www.ahistoryofitaly.com and all social media, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and of course, Twitter. Absolutely fantastic. And of course, Marco, if anybody is needing any help with the process of Italian citizenship, how can they get in contact with you and your team at Italian Citizenship Assistance? People can send us a message through our website, italiancitizenshipassistance.com, or give us a call, the numbers on the website. Absolutely fantastic. And of course, if you're interested in more content like this about Italian citizenship and the discussions and going into detail about the process, be sure that you are subscribed to this YouTube channel or the audio only podcast. But if you are also subscribed to the YouTube channel, you also have the bonus of being automatically subscribed to the Italian real estate podcast as well that Marco and I do together. And also, if you're interested in more content about life in Italy, living in Italy, and living in Italy as an Italian dual citizen expat, be sure to come over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rafael Di Furia, or you can find my audio only podcast where I also go outside and show you some of this beautiful country that all three of us are blessed to call home. Anyway, thank you all so much for joining us for another episode of the Italian Citizenship Podcast presented by ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com. Of course, we have been here with Italian attorney Marco Permuni and podcaster Mike Corradi. And I am Rafael Di Furia, and we will see you all next time. Stay safe and healthy out there. Thank Later. you. Later. Thank you.